Today is Wednesday, March 22nd, and we are here at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin on this Wednesday evening to study from the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis chapter 41 tonight, so I want to invite you to be turning in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 41. We'll be there in just a few moments. I want to let you know that if you're not in the habit of being with us on Sunday, you are absolutely invited to be with us on Sunday morning at 930. We're working our way through the book of Isaiah. And at 10.30, we're studying the book of Hebrews. So this coming Lord's Day, we'll be looking at the last few verses of Hebrews chapter 4. We want to invite you to be there. And if you have any questions about class tonight, uh, give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. Or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. Or simply go to our website, fourlakeschurch.org. And there's contact information there. And make sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't done that already. We would certainly appreciate it if you would do that. But but tonight again, we're back to the study of the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings written by Moses, and we're now looking at the life of Joseph, so Israel's favorite son. He's been sold by his brothers, sold into slavery in Egypt, and although he's been falsely accused of raping his master's wife, he is thrown into prison, and he works his way up in the prison until he's in charge of the entire prison. And last week, we had Joseph correctly interpret the dreams of both the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. The cupbearer, of course, was restored to his position. The baker is executed just as Joseph predicted. And, of course, he was able to do all of that with God's help. So that brings us tonight to Genesis chapter 41. Let's look at the first eight verses tonight. Genesis chapter 41, verses 1 through 8. Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he was standing by the Nile, and lo, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows, then Pharaoh awoke, he fell asleep and dreamed a second time, and behold, seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. The thin ears were swallowed. Uh, the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now in the morning his spirit was troubled, so he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Well, in verse 1, we find that two years have passed. And I just want to note that it says two full years. So these certainly were very long years for Joseph, having been forgotten by the chief cupbearer for those two years. But of course, at this time, Pharaoh has a couple of weird dreams. And we've talked about dreams in this class before. In these two dreams, he's got the uh, seven fat cows coming up out of the Nile River eating marsh grass. And they are swallowed up by seven skinny cows. So that's a weird one. And he wakes up from that. He falls back to sleep. He has a second dream. And this is where we have the seven oversized ears of grain getting swallowed up by the seven thin ears of grain. And Pharaoh's very disturbed by this. Obviously, a lot of the gods in Egypt are tied to the Nile and their crops and this. And so he's concerned. He's disturbed. He wakes up. He starts calling for the various magicians and the wise men, but, but nobody dares interpret the dream. Nobody has a clue about this, and that's kind of surprising to me. You would think somebody might take a stab at it, but uh, nobody wants to get involved in this one, so they kind of back away slowly. Nobody has any idea what's going on here with this dream. So let's continue then with Genesis 41 verses 9 through 13. Genesis 41, 9 through 13. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I would make mention today of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants, and he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. We had a dream on the same night. He and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now a Hebrew youth was with us there, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related them to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream, and just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me in my office, but he hanged him. So as Pharaoh's calling for somebody to interpret dreams, and as nobody's coming forward, the chief cupbearer suddenly remembers Joseph. So this jogs his memory. I know a guy. Uh, this, this young man helped me, and, and so he almost seems to apologize to Pharaoh. I kind of hesitate to bring up my criminal history here. Uh, but here it, here it is. I was in prison. There was this guy. 
And he tells the story of how he landed in prison along with the chief baker and how there was this Hebrew young man who accurately interpreted both of their dreams. So the baker was hanged, the cupbearer was restored to his position, uh, just as Joseph had interpreted based on those dreams. So let's go on and continue with Genesis 41, verses 14 through 24. Genesis 41, 14 through 24. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I have heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph then answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So Pharaoh spoke to Joseph in my dream. Behold, I was standing on the bank of the Nile and behold, seven cows flat, fat and sleek came up out of the Nile and they grazed in the marsh grass. Lo, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such as I had never seen for ugliness in all the land of Egypt. And the lean and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. Yet when they had devoured them, it could not be detected that they had devoured them, for they were just as ugly as before. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears, full and good, came up on a single stalk, and lo, seven ears, withered, thin, and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. And the thin ear swallowed up the seven good ears. Then I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Well, Pharaoh, therefore, immediately calls for Joseph after hearing about this young man. They, they bring him out of the dungeon. And let's notice that as they bring him out of the dungeon, Joseph uh, shaves himself and he changes his clothing. And I just want us to note this because I don't know about you. I have personally heard some people use this passage to make the argument that we need to dress up for church. And uh, this is the danger of having an opinion and then going to the Bible to try to find support for that opinion. Uh, this, this passage has nothing whatsoever to do with what we wear to worship. If it did, um, I'm afraid we may conclude that it is a sin to come to church with a beard. And uh, obviously that cannot be the case. <laughs> um, and so if somebody says we need to wear the very best outfits that we have to come to worship on Sunday morning, and here are 30 references to prove it, and if this is in that list of references, uh, we need to be very careful with everything else that they say, because really this is an example of taking a scripture completely out of context to try to prove something uh, that Moses never intended. This was the farthest thing from Moses' mind as he's writing this passage. This is not why this is in the Bible. Uh, but nevertheless, Joseph, he cleans himself up. He comes out of the prison. He comes to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh pretty much says, I hear you can interpret dreams. I hear you may have an answer to my little situation here. But I want us to notice Joseph does not take any honor for himself, does he? It would have been so easy for this young man to promote himself. Why, yes, I can. I have this history. I can do these amazing things, Pharaoh. I am your guy, that kind of thing. But he doesn't do that. He gives God the credit here. So it's not in me. This is not my thing, but God will give Pharaoh a favorable or an accurate answer. And this is keeping certainly in, in keeping with Joseph's attitude uh, with the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker in that he gave credit to God back in those cases as well. So Pharaoh explains the dreams. He concludes by noting that he's already gone to the magicians. I'm, I'm already, I've already tried everything that I know to try here, uh, but he doesn't yet have a, a decent answer. So let's move on then with Genesis 41, verses 25 through 36. Genesis 41, 25 through 36. Now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one and the same. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven thin ears scorched by the east wind will be seven years of famine. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt, and after them seven years of famine will come, and all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will ravage the land." So the abundance will be unknown in the land because of that subsequent famine, for it will be very severe. Now, as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God, and God will quickly bring it about. Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. 
Then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. Let the food become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land will not perish during the famine. Well, we come to this interpretation. So Joseph explains that Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. Two dreams, but it's the same message. And so these dreams, they are not random. That's something else he points out. This is a message from God. God has spoken to you in these two dreams concerning what God is about to do. And we might think of the opening line of Hebrews where the author says that God in times past spoke to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Remember that passage? We just looked at that on Sunday morning a couple months ago. But in previous times, God spoke in some rather unusual ways, didn't he? And certainly one of those ways God communicated was through dreams or through visions. And that's what's going on here. God has a message for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. He is using his servant Joseph to interpret this message. And to summarize, Egypt is about to experience seven years of amazing abundance, followed by seven years of a terrible famine. And this famine will be severe. And God has given the dream twice to indicate that God has already decided this. There's no negotiation here. This is what will happen. And that the timing is to start immediately. So starting right now, at this moment, kind of God is saying, I'm pressing the, the timer, I'm pressing the stopwatch here. Egypt, from now, will have seven years of abundance to be immediately followed by seven years of virtually no food whatsoever. And the application of this message, the so what of this section, is that Pharaoh needs to find somebody. He needs to find somebody really wise, somebody really discerning to manage this crisis to manage whatever it is that is about to happen. So somebody needs to be put in charge of getting us through this. And not only that, but you need to assemble a team to be responsible for collecting one-fifth of the produce over the next seven years so that you can survive the next seven years. And I guess if I were to gather, you guys know I'm not good at math, but I'm kind of wondering uh, why save one-fifth instead of one-seventh? You know, why save up more than the absolute minimum. And there may be several reasons for this. Uh, one possibility is to account for waste or uh, spoilage. Yeah, I don't know, rodent infestation. I, if you can imagine storing huge amounts of grain, something can go wrong. Uh, but the other part of this is to save up more so that Egypt then has the ability to barter or trade as they supply food to surrounding nations, and that ultimately will strengthen the nation. And we'll see this in the coming chapters. But this will be a huge project. I think that's kind of the point here. In order to save one-fifth of all of the produce of a land like Egypt, we're going to need overseers. Uh, grain will need to be gathered. We're going to have to have places to put all of this. It'll have to be guarded. And uh, this is incredibly important. The future of the nation depends on this. The survival of the nation depends on getting this right. I was kind of wondering, uh, what wouldn't we give today for our leaders to know exactly what would happen over the next 14 years? And yet that's what's going on here. An amazing blessing that God is giving in this regard. So let's continue then with Genesis 41, verses 38 through 45. Genesis 41, 38 through 45. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this, in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put the gold necklace around his neck. He had him ride in his second chariot and they proclaimed before him, bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh named Joseph Zaphonath Paneah, and he gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, as his wife, and Joseph went forth over the land of Egypt. I love verse 38. We have Pharaoh obviously believing the message. He's convinced this is the truth, this is the way it's going to be. And so he turns to his servants and basically asks, You know, I wonder, do we know anybody smart who can handle this? Anybody? 
Anybody? You know, anybody want to speak up? And obviously nobody was smart enough to have the interpretation of the dream. And so, you know, this is after the smartest of the smart in all the land had no idea what those dreams were about. And so it's obvious Joseph is the guy. Joseph is the only one who can handle this. So since God told you about all this, and since you obviously are wise and discerning, uh, you are now in charge of this project. You are the man. And not only is Joseph in charge of prepping for the upcoming famine, but in order to accomplish this, Pharaoh basically puts Joseph in charge of the entire nation. And uh, this is what it'll take to properly prepare for this. And to make this happen, to make this public, uh, notice Pharaoh gives Joseph his signet ring. This is like giving somebody your signature, the signet ring. It was used to seal official documents. Uh, today, we may refer to uh, giving somebody your power of attorney. What this person signs, it is as if I am signing it. So from now on, whatever Joseph does, he will be doing with Pharaoh's permission and authority. For all practical purposes, Joseph is now Pharaoh. Joseph is basically the king of Egypt. He gets the ring. He also gets the fancy Pharaoh clothing. He gets the gold chain around his neck. I'm thinking of some of the artwork that we have from the ancient world. Uh, Joseph is full-blown looking like an Egyptian at this point. So he's given Pharaoh's chariot, and uh, everybody now has to bow down to Joseph just as they would bow down to Pharaoh. In fact, Pharaoh proclaims that no one shall raise his hand or his foot anywhere in the land of Egypt without Joseph's permission. So what an amazing turn of events. Joseph goes from being beat up and thrown into a pit and sold into slavery where he lands in prison to being falsely accused of rape and all of that uh, to now uh, being pretty much second only to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, with Egypt being pretty much the world's only superpower at this point. So Joseph rules the world. He goes from the bottom to the top. He's given this Egyptian name. He's given an Egyptian wife. He heads out to travel the land of Egypt to start prepping for this upcoming famine. Well, let's continue tonight with Genesis 41, verses 46 through 49. Genesis 41, 46 through 49. Now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundantly. So he gathered all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and placed the food in the cities. He placed in every city the food from its own surrounding fields. Thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea." until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. In verse 46, we plug into a timeline as we find that Joseph is 30 years old when he stands before Pharaoh. Uh, by the way, who else in the Bible pops on the scene at the age of 30? Jesus, isn't it? And this reminds me, this past Sunday, one of our members pulled me aside after or before worship, I can't remember which one, but just mentioned uh, noticing the references to three days in the dreams of both the baker and the cupbearer in last week's message. And uh, one of our members was noting that three days seems to be significant in Scripture, and I, I would agree to that. Uh, we have Jonah in the belly of the fish for three days. We've got Jesus in the tomb for three days. I'm sure there are many other references there. Uh, but thank you for pointing that out. That's a very good, uh, good observation there. But here Joseph is 30 years old, and he basically goes on tour as he starts prepping the nation for this upcoming disaster, and he's in charge of getting them through it. In verse 47, we find during the first seven years, the nation is in fact blessed abundantly, and under Joseph's direction, they collect for the purpose of storing it. And they collect not just in one central storehouse, uh, but the food is stockpiled strategically all throughout the nation. Very wise to do that. Of course, these storehouses are closer to where the grain's coming in. But not only that, if there's a fire, uh, again, some kind of infestation, if some kind of foreign nation invades, you know, at least the entire stockpile will not be at risk. And notice down in verse 49, it gets to the point where they have so much extra grain, they just stop measuring. And it's like the sand of the sea, uh, which is the phrase that we've seen before, isn't it? It was used to describe how Abraham's descendants would multiply, they would bless the earth at some point in the future. And so the grain is beyond measure. So let's continue then with Genesis 41, verses 50 through 52. Genesis 41, 50 through 52. Now before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore to him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh. 
For he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and my father's household. He named the second Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. We find in these few verses that during the seven years of plenty, Joseph is blessed as well with two children, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh coming from a word meaning forget. Obviously, there were some things in his life he probably would rather forget. And then Ephraim coming from a word referring to fruitfulness. And I hope we notice how Manasseh is specifically referred to as being the firstborn. And yet, if you're familiar with scripture, you may remember that over in Genesis 31, 9, God very clearly refers to Ephraim as his firstborn. And the important thing to note is that firstborn can sometimes be a title of honor more than a description of actual birth order. In the literal sense, it is the birth order. But sometimes this word is used figuratively. And this is significant. Because when Jesus is described as being the firstborn of all creation over in Colossians 1.15, uh, the so-called Jehovah's Witnesses will often uh, try to use that to prove that Jesus was actually born and did not exist from eternity. So they'll kind of take that out of context to try to prove that. But I'm just saying we need to understand that firstborn is sometimes used figuratively. It is not always used literally. It is sometimes used figuratively as a title of respect, as opposed to always referring to the literal birth order. And we've seen this already in Genesis, haven't we? We saw Esau being born first, but trading his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup. You cannot literally trade to rearrange the order of your birth, can you? Soup does not change your birth order, but you could apparently swap the title. And I mention this because this is where we find that Manasseh was born first, but later in scripture, Jeremiah 31, 9, Ephraim is known as God's firstborn. And that'll become significant in the New Testament, specifically when we get to Jesus being referred to as the firstborn, not literally the first to be born, but he had a place of honor. So let's conclude tonight with Genesis 41, verses 53 through 57. Genesis 41 Verses 53 through 57. When the seven years of plenty, which had been in the land of Egypt, came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said, then there was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread, and Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, you shall do. When the famine was spread over all the face of the earth, then Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. The people of all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph, because the famine was severe in all the earth. We finally get to the end of the seven years of plenty. And just as God had revealed to Pharaoh through the dreams, just as Joseph had predicted with God's help, the famine starts. There's no bread. The people, they're famished. And when the people cry out for bread, Pharaoh directs everybody to Joseph. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. And Joseph opens the storehouses. He sells the grain back to the Egyptians. It's just like the government, I think we could maybe say. You know, take their grain and then sell it back to them. But uh, this is what keeps them alive. Uh, not only that, but people from other nations are experiencing the same famine. So this is widespread, and they come to Egypt for help. The word gets out that uh, Egypt has bread, so they go there. And uh, so the nation of Egypt is able to help others as well. And this is where we leave it tonight. So tonight we've seen God continue to remember Joseph, bringing him from the dungeon all the way up to the second most powerful man in the entire world, and putting him in a position where he can help literally millions of people survive. Most importantly, He's going to end up helping God's people survive so that the Messiah could someday be born. Uh, next week, we hope to continue with chapter 42. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I hope to see most of you this coming Sunday. Again, Isaiah, we're studying at uh, 930. And then the last few verses of Hebrews chapter 4, we'll jump into uh, during our 1030 worship assembly. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of Joseph, and we have certainly seen you continue working in Joseph's life in this passage that we've studied tonight. You are a God who sees and cares for your people, and we realize that this is still true today. And so, Father, we ask tonight that you would use us in any way that you see fit. Use us to bless the world around us, both physically but especially spiritually. 
Give us the courage to speak up when we should, even on difficult issues, even when your word teaches completely opposite of everything we see in the world around us. Father, help us to keep from getting polluted by this world. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.